Good afternoon. This is Dr. Dan Guerra from Vera Med Studios. Today we're going to have a new topic, which is actually going to be a furtherance of our discussion of how the immunoepigenomic profiling in living systems can help explain differentiation, development, pathology, and physiology. We're trying to look at a model or a theory that I've been examining for the last four lectures on what I call the diaventome or diaventology. So before we uh, go any further, let me just say that again, I'm Dr. Daniel Guerra. I am Chief Scientific Officer and co-owner founder of Verev Med. You're, we're coming to you right now from Verev Med Studios in the inland Pacific Northwest. Um, okay, so other than that, uh, there is our website and there is our official email. Uh, at the end of this top talk, I'll also show you our um, Facebook page and my individual specific email if you want to contact me related to this lecture or any other lectures that you happen to see on the web. All my lectures are posted on my Facebook, and eventually I'm going to put them all on our website. So let's go ahead and get started with this lecture. Today I'm going to talk about natural killer cells and the switch to tissue remodeling. Okay, so the paper we're going to look at was published just about uh, two months ago in the Journal of Biological Chemistry, one of my absolute favorite journals, of course. And let's do some background first of all. Among the innate immune cells, natural killer cells are perhaps the most definitive in their precision of agency. It is a responsibility of natural killer cells to maintain a knife's edge balance between physiological surveillance of the host cells and an abrupt militarization of action upon stimulation, or they call it activation, using a basic repertoire of cell surface protein receptors, including NKG2D, DNAM1, NKP30, NKP46, and P44. Those are all going to be players that we're going to see off and on in today's lecture. Now, with a contradictory induction, they are under the control of suppressor receptors, okay? They meaning natural killer cells, and they inhibit their killer character. These include killer immunoglobulin-like receptors like CD94 and KG2A. Also see those as players today in my lecture. Besides surveilling as agents of target cell lysis, as in clearance of virally infected or malignant transformed cells, Natural killer cells can also perform in the inflammatory response, in fact, interacting with native T cell populations, as we'll see. And they've been implicated, in fact, as agents of autoimmune diseases, such as the classic rheumatoid arthritis, or RA. Now, it's from a textbook. Uh, this is Kuby's Immunology, and uh, I think it's the seventh edition. I used to teach immunology, so we used to use this book quite extensively in, in graduate immunology. This is a very simple model for uh, natural killer recognition and lysis of target cells. And remember that you have an opposing or contradictory situation going on. This is so that you do not accidentally kill host cells. Okay, so take a look at this. It's kind of interesting. All right. So when you want to have uh, the activating receptor uh, shut down. You have an activating receptor reacting with a normal cell that has a ligand, some protein ligand shown here. Now, at the same time, there's an inhibitory receptor on the NK cell, which again is it negates the activation, and it interacts with a, a, a class one major histocompatibility complex re, uh, receptor on the normal cell. So when you have this activating receptor engaging ligands on the target of cell surfaces, activation can be circumvented or inhibited by uh, the, the inhibitory receptor, IR, which detects the major histocompatibility complex one and how much of it is on the surface of the normal cell. Now, if this is going to be a virus infected cell, you usually get a drop in class one MHC on the surface. So you don't have that inhibitory complex binding to the inhibitory receptor on the NK cell, see? So NK activity is suppressed if MHC levels are unaltered, thus sparing normal cells. So 
But when you don't have the MHC1, what goes down is that you do get the activation of the signaling. So that's what I mean about how it being more of a direct sort of immune cell system than the more complicated multiple receptor mediated responses of normal T cells, even killer, killer T cells or cytotoxic T cells. And we'll see that later. So NKs all express a 140 kilodalton isoform of something called the neural cell adhesion protein isoform CD56, while lacking the cell surface CD3, which is more indicative, of course, of T cells. Natural killer cells are grouped into three subsets based upon the expression of CD56 and 57, which is a known marker of replicative senescence and terminal differentiation that we find actually in CD8 plus T cells. So here are the three different cellular phenotypes. Just catch them and you won't ever forget them. You have CD56 bright, CD57 negative NK cells. And when you have that system going, bright means you have a heavy expression of CD56 and the minus sign means you have no or very negligible levels of CD57 expressed on the surface. You get high interferon gamma levels and you exert minimal cytotoxic, cytotoxic effector function. So this is going to be an inflammatory sort of system. When you have CD56 dim, CD57 plus NK cells, they have low interferon, interferon gamma, which again is a pro-inflammatory cytokine. And what those cells do, that phenotype, is you get a high degree of cytotoxicity. Okay. CD56 dim, CD57 minus are actually intermediate population that's expressing moderate levels of the uh, pro-inflammatory cytokine interferon or gamma, and they exert a temperate cytotoxic, cytotoxic effector function. Okay. Now, upon stimulation in general, NK cells are cytotoxic, thus killing target cells through two major mechanisms that require direct contact with the NKs and their target. So remember, cytotoxicity requires contact, whereas inflammation can deal with soluble signaling through inflammatory cytokines and even chemokines, indeed. So one pathway for the cytotoxic killing uh, activity involves target cell lysis mediated by cytotoxic molecules. Those include things, enzymes like perforin and granzymes, and those are normally stored in secretory lysosomes within the NK cell. The other pathway actually involves the engagement of another set of receptors called death receptors and their ligands. That concludes the FAS-L or TRAIL uh, receptor systems, and that results in caspase-mediated apoptosis. So you have two different ways then of killing the cells. You can cause them to apoptose, or you can kill them with the perforin granzymes, which basically just opens the cells up and destroys all the proteins. Have two different mechanisms. Thus, NKs are poised to release cytokines and growth factors that can initiate inflammatory responses mediated by both the innate and the adaptive immune response. So these are basically a link. These are a bridge between the innate system and the acquired system. So natural killer cells are really uh, exotic and they provide full measure um, communication between the two arms of the immune system the acquired and the innate. Some background now that we need to continue to discuss here. Because remember, we're going to talk about how genetics and environment come together in a trigonal planar understanding of cellular activity and overall organismal differentiation, development, and ultimately senescence and death. This is the diaventomic um, consideration we're trying to eventually develop here. So what I want to give you in background is to recall that genetic and epigenetic mechanisms shape me metabolic activity, and they can respond negatively to produce sometimes a pathophysiological state. While the genome establishes a template for developmental and metabolic patterns, an adaptational phenomenon helps to produce the final phenotype. The latter is called an epigenetic mechanism and has become a key subject of developmental cell biology, gene expression, and even disease. The biochemistry of epigenetics involves several covalent modifications of nuclear chromatin, that means both DNA and histones, as well as post-transcriptional RNA-based gene silencing. 
interfering RNA, small interfering RNA, for example. So these modifications can be reversibly administered by interactions with the genome caused by and resulting in poor nutrition and lifestyle. So here's where the environment comes in. And of course, a spatiotemporal pathological metastate. Okay. So this is all very important, our understanding of how living systems actually function. Now, among those specific modifications in the epigenome are methylation of the carbon-5 atom of cytosine residues found in certain canonical CPG islands, the cytosine uh, uh, phosphodiester to guanosine, associated with promoter elements. Okay, so that is a really important aspect. So you can get methylation, as I just said, but beyond methylation, you get acetylation, you can get ubiquitinylation, you can get phosphorylation of the cohering histones. So you have the carbon-5 atom of cytosine in CPG islands, but you also have histones, which can be covalently modified via those various me uh, mechanism uh, mechanisms just mentioned. You also get a processing of double-stranded RNA in the generation of small interfering RNA. And of course, that's the gene silencing, canonical gene silencing. The mechanisms here include the activities, of course, of enzymes. Those include methyltransferases, acetyltransferases, kinases, phosphatases, demethylases, deacetylases, ubiquitin ligases, and of course, RNases. Substrates for these reactions are either chromatin, or in the case of the RNase activity, just usually double-stranded RNA. So what other kind of substrates do you need? You need S-adenosine with thionine, called either SAM or Atomet. And it is actually the recognized nuclear methylation agent. Yeah. Actually, it comes from uh, tetrahydrofolate, that methyl group. So you obtain the methyl group from folic acid derivatives. And again, that's a whole C1 or carbon-1 cycle that we talk about in biochemistry class. Now, acetyl-CoA is the acetylation agent. So that's pretty straightforward. That can come from basic metabolism. Uh, and um, the associated histones that become acetylated uh, are in the process of what we call chromatin remodeling. When you acetylate histones in a piece of chromatin, in a sector of chromatin, you generally enhance gene expression downstream from the ligand receptor mediated activation of a complex. And that could be an association even with ubiquitin and proteosomal pathways. It gets a little bit more complicated very quickly. Nuclear associated post translational modifications like this acetylation of histone carboxy termini clearly alter chromatin structure and function. So remember, this is a structure function relationship, as always. The major effect is a pronounced change in the physical chemical accessibility of the DNA binding proteins uh, that ultimately unwind the double helix and potentiate transcription to RNA. So that's how this thing works. So, a little bit more about epigenetics. Every cell is an identical copy of nuclear DNA. The expression of genes is controlled by the activity of what we loosely call the promoter region. Promoters are controlled by a vast array of transacting factors, that's usually proteins, which bind DNA and uh, they do so via covalent modification. Most common covalent modification, as we've already mentioned, is this methylation. All modifications to genes other than changes in DNA sequence itself are actually epigenetic. They are include addition of methyl groups to the DNA backbone, as we've mentioned. Adding these groups changes the appearance and the structure, physical chemical properties of DNA. Now, when I say appearance, that's a, that's a biochemical term, actually. So how that molecule, that changed molecule, appears in three-dimensional space-time is how that structure then can carry out a specific function. Yeah. So the change, the change is how gene, this, this process changes how genes interact with other molecules in the cell nucleus, lots of other molecules. So methylation promoter DNA shuts transcription off, generally speaking, and we call it silencing, and it can be transferred mitotically and meiotically to um, daughter cells. Factors which control methylation then control gene expression, of course. Besides the phenomenon we just mentioned, gene expression is controlled via chromatin remodeling and the ubiquitin pathway, which is a scheduled controlled uh, proteolytic pathway. You also have this something that's been known for a long time called parental imprinting, 
You have addition of a methyl group to DNA, and then it's used on some genes to distinguish a gene copy inherited from the father or the mother. This is called imprinting, and it distinguishes each gene copy, because you know we're diploid organisms, right? That provides additional information to the cell. Now, that performs copy prejudice by making certain proteins, okay? So let's take a look at this. Uh, diagram and put all these different covalent modifications together. You have methyl transferases, which can be added to lysine residues. You can have demethylases, which can pull the methyl group off. Kinases add phosphate. Phosphatases remove it. That could be in serine or threonine residues. You can also get methyl transferases uh, specifically in, uh, in from arginine going to citrulline. This is a totally different process, but is very important in certain diseases such as rheumatoid arthritis and lupus, also in some cancers, Parkinson's disease, and even in Alzheimer's disease, okay? So this particular methyl transferase is very specific uh, to this arginine residue, okay? Um, again, you have the, uh, the um, histone acetyltransferase and the HDACs, which we've talked about quite a bit here at Verab Med. Uh, the sirtuins and the HDACs, of course, are deacetylases, and they're all get on lysine residues. That's what that is there. All right. So that's all happening then. On uh, you can see that's all happening on the histone, and then of course you do get this methylation, demethylation on that cytosine residue uh, on the CPG island. All right. So that's all background. Let's get now. Let's get into the paper. Again, JBC paper published a few months ago. Now, since methylation can be an on-off switch for chromatin remodeling, mediated nation transcription, which I basically hope just hopefully just convinced you of, both the combined accumulation of covalent histone methylation and sequence specificity must be read out according to transcript level. Okay, so that ultimately that will help control the level of transcript. Okay, if you're following along. Now, in particular, the methylation of histone three had lysine residues 4, 36, and 79, and that's how the nomenclature comes in. See that there? That K is the lysine residue, the H is the histone, and those are the various positions, okay, on the protein. Those are associated with the transcriptional activation, whereas methylation of histone 3 at lysine 9 and 27 is transcriptional silencing. So it gets more complicated. It's hierarchical. Methylation doesn't just shut off expression. In fact, it can turn on expression, okay? All right. Now that's of the histone. This is called the histone code. So what that means is that histone methylation and demethylation are complex elastic phenomena. Elastic meaning you can go and make an effect, you can change an effect, like when you stretch a rubber band and the elastic response, but when you let the tension go on that rubber band, it goes back into register as it was before. So you can demethylate and completely turn 180 all the prescribed events that you caused by that methylation patterning. That's important. So you have elastic and plastic events. Plastic means you make a change and the change stays. Okay, and you can also get that with epigenomic programming. You get both plastic and elastic phenomena. Now, the methyl transferase, EZH2, which is called EZH2 because it's the enhancer of Zesty homolog 2. Sorry, again, the geneticists make all kinds of bizarre names for their genes. Sorry, I'm a biochemist. We tend to be much more analytical. Otherwise, we're pretty transcendental. But when it comes to naming things, we're very analytical. Anyway, that particular methyl transfer catalyzes the S-adenosimethionine-dependent trimethylation of that particular histone. Members of the Jumanji domain-containing, JMJ, Iron and two oxoglutarate dependent, uh, that's a better term there, oxygenases catalyze demethylation of methylated histone lysines. So there you got the methyl transferase, and then you've got the Jumanji, okay, the JMJ, okay? It's good. JMJ does not stand for, in this case, Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, okay? But it's interesting, I noticed that that, that particular anagram's there, huh? Anyway, GMG, GMJ D3 and KDM6B and the ubiquitously transcribed tetratrichopeptide repeat gene X chromosome. Okay, so these are then called UTX and KDM6A, thank God, are demethylases of that particular uh, histone uh, lysine 27 and on two and three. That's what that ME stands for, that methyl group. 
and UTX uh, appropriately. And that appears to be constitutively expressed in many tissues. Okay. JMJD3 then is inducible by lipopolysaccharide, several cytokines, usually pro-inflammatory, not always, and growth factors, okay, in fact, neural growth factors. Both enzymes play important roles in macrophage activity. We've talked a lot about macrophages. Those are part of the innate immune response. They're also antigen-presenting cells. Development and stem cell function. So these are really important enzymes, these methylases and methyl trans demethylases and methyltransferases. UTX is actually a component of transcriptional complexes, such as the trithorax and MLL, which stands for mixed lineage leukemia, which regulate gene activation through the histone 3, lysine 4, methyltransferase, and lysine 27 demethylase activities. Okay, so I know there's a whole lot of information, but I need to get this all out to you because you have to understand the complexity. You don't have to carry all this complexity in your head but I put it there so you can go back and review my lecture and you can see that that's, what, that's the kind of complexity we're talking about. Now, the purpose of the research here is that they're going to describe to you in the JBC paper is what ways do natural killer cells respond to methylomic aerations in terms of key aspects of activation and readout, such as cytotoxicity and pro-inflammatory responses, okay? of interest. So they want to know, this, basically, is methylation change whether or not you're cytotoxic or pro-inflammatory? Does that have any effect at all on either one? Of interest to my clients and a research agenda is the association of epigenetics and controlling natural killer cell biology. And that helps establish the potential for a diaventomic control over homeostasis. Again, we're looking at the immunoepigenomics of the system, and that's where the diaventomic uh, system theory comes to play. Remember, here's the diaventoma as I described in the last, uh, I think, four lectures. Uh, okay, so you have, so I described it initially as neural networking, where you have genome on one arm. It's a trigonal planar uh, diagram. Genome on one arm, the environment on the other. We know that gene expression and that all of cellular responses are an interaction between genome and environment. But we also need to know that we have an immunoepigenome. And the immunoepigenome actually becomes the translation of the genome by environment interaction. You have the immune response, which is always functioning in all parts of the body. And then you have an epigenomic programming of the immune response. That makes for the third arm of this complex system. So I first described it for neural networks because we're trying to understand how the brain works. So that's what I continue to use it as is my uh, prefrontal lobal understanding of uh, under, understanding of it. Neural networks are processes becoming eventual in nature as opposed to substantial. That means they're not substances. Neural networks are events. That's why this is called the diaventum. An event ontology rather than a substance ontology then, a la Whitehead from philosophy, that reaches across, that's the dia, the neural network of genetic and environmental, see here, interaction. And it's articulated and synthesized through an epigenetic, which we just covered what epigenetics is, modification of the classical immune system, which some of you have probably have great understanding of, and some of you have very little or none. And hopefully if you've been watching my lectures, you're starting to learn more. That creates, however, a responsive plastic and elastic memory, which I've already now explained what that means. A field, that's a field capable of learning, ideation, imagination, understanding through time, through the fourth dimension time, the three spatial dimensions and the fourth dimension time. The pattern of events then appears energetic fields rather than particles of matter, much like chemical bonds. Chemical bonds are indeed, there is matter there, but the chemical bond itself is an event. So you have a central individual, okay, the individual given host, say, that has a specific genome that you inherited, a specific environment that's constantly changing that you live in, and then the iteration of those two interactions into an immunoepigenome. So you have a central individual agentically that's acting as an agent, interacting through the events obtained across the inherited genome, the changing environment, and what I call the transcendental or working above or the means by which the immunoepigenome works through time. So 
that's not enough. Let me explain it one more time. It's an, as I have ontology then, it's an adaptational processive accounting of the rational human mind through cellular molecular event ontology. That was my original conception, okay? Now I'm broadening it, not just to have the central nervous system involved. And I, I, uh, I, I offered that possibility to you in my earlier lectures. And so hopefully you may have picked up on that. The immunoepigenomic induction of neural, endocrine, and metabolic response to the micro and macro environment. Micro means inside, macro means outside in this particular uh, case, in, in, in this particular syntax. Through classical constitutive surveillance and acquired effector cellular and humoral defense stratagems using reversible covalent modification and hydrophobic interactions, which involve lipids, of course, of nucleic acids, proteins, and lipids. This may become, if we can work it out and do some good experiments to uh, either refute it or to add to its potentiation, may become the central molecular theory for free will driven agency based existing individual adaptation. That is why one individual's biology is different from an identical twin, for example. So that's really important in biomedicine when we talk about having patient associated uh, medical practice, right? Where we deal with individual medical um, procedures for individual genotypes and phenotypes. Okay. And that's what this whole diaventology arose from an understanding of each individual having a precise biological event ontology. So individual adaptation and knowledge acquiring epistemology, that's, again, that's really important. That explains the core event ontology of human existence. So I'm trying to get a much larger picture here not just of, again, the physiological responses, but I want to take the molecularity of biochemistry, move it through cell biology and take it up to the host and eventually develop a theory on uh, how central nervous system is able to remember things and work through time. So here are some die events in physiology and pathophysiology. It's a very brief understanding, but it is necessary for us to continue this lecture. So we have molecular and cellular events that occur across mechanisms that result in real-time modification to changing conditions. Basically, that's what we're talking about here. That one um, premise is the underlying feature of everything we're going to talk about. So the mechanisms I'm referring to there include, but are not limited to, all the things we talk about in biochemistry. Replication, recombination, repair of DNA, transcription, alternate splicing, translation of RNA, signal transduction, all that, hormones, phosphorylation cascades, uh, voltage-gated channels, all that beautiful business, right? Membrane fluid dynamics, something I've talked about in my earlier lectures when we talked about sphingolipids and galactolipids and interaction in, say, uh, at synapses. Immune synapses, neural synapses, for example, involve membrane fluid dynamics. We also, another mechanism is sulfate repertoire autophagy, which we talked about quite a bit, apoptosis, program cell death, senescence, the aging process and necrosis, the killing of cells, the death of cells, right? Developmental programs include things like embryogenesis, a lot more. Cellular division and differentiation also is involved here, of course. That includes adipogenesis, neurogenesis, myelocytogenesis, lymphocytogenesis, gametogenesis, oncogenesis, and on and on. So just trying to give you the full measure of what the, when I say mechanism, any of these things are fair game. Obviously, we're not going to talk about all of them at once, right? All right. Now, here's a paper. Remember this Jumanji histone de, is a demethylase. So the title of this first, this is a slide from the data. Jumanji histone demethylase, bet bromodomains. There's the bromodomain, there's the Jumanji demethylase, and the histone deacetylase. This is a... Um, histogram showing you relative activity. And then there's overall histone methyl transferase activity. So what we're looking at here, these are all different genetic loci, okay? Now take a look at this. Activated natural killer cells secrete pro-inflammatory cytokines like interferon gamma, as I mentioned. They do that when they're stimulated by pro-inflammatory cytokines themselves. IL-2, IL-12, IL-15 in particular is a real hot ticket item to activate NK cells. Okay. So interferon gamma is indicative of natural killer cell function. When you see interferon gamma 
and you're looking for what cell types are out are playing playing in that measure and k's are going to be involved somewhere so a screening with a focused library of small molecule inhibitors can interrogate that phenomenon, that inflammatory phenomenon. Notice a significant reduction of secreted interferon gamma with inhibition of histone demethylases, histone deacetylases, this is the inhibition, the red here, and the bromodomain. So there's the bromodomain, there's the Jumanji demethylase, and there's just uh, histone deacetylase with HDAC. So this means negative. That means less of this log level of interferon gamma. So what it's telling you, you get a reduction in secreted pro-inflammatory cytokine when you inhibit the demethylase, the bromodomain, okay, uh, and uh, the uh, de uh, histone deacetylase, the HDAC, the demethylase, and the bromodomain. Now, what is a bromodomain? The bromodomain is actually a reader, okay? So I'll, I'll explain that in a moment. So demethylase inhibitors inactive, inactivate regional isomers like GSKJ5 have no effect. So as a control for this experiment, okay, this is once again showing you the amount of interferon gamma that you lose when you're using the inhibitor GSKJ4, but when you use the inactive regional chemical isomer, it's just a chemical isomer, uh, you get no inhibition. So it's a good control, right? So just the GSK J4 inhibits the demethylase. And that's shown here in this histogram. Okay, there's DMSO, that's just a carrier, dimethyl sulfoxide, regular amount of activity. You add the inhibitor of the demethylase, boom, you drop it. If you add the analog, the isomer, the regional isomer, it looks like the control. Okay, so that's what this is showing you here. Also, what this data is saying is natural killer cells incubated with GSK, J4, lead to a reduction in proliferation. That's 1C. This is cellular proliferation here, okay? So you get a reduction in interferon gamma, which is a pro-inflammatory cytokine. You also get a reduction in proliferation. Now, there's no alterations in programmed cell death following a 48 hour of culture with either four, with JSK4, which is a demethylase inhibitor. But HDAC inhibitors did increase apoptosis. Now, this is what this data shows you down here. You don't really need to worry about that. Um, what we're really trying to tell you is that program cell death doesn't seem to be effective. Remember, that's a readout for cytotoxicity. Right? So GSK J4 is a cell permeable and potent inhibitor of demethylases. That's really what this paper is trying to tell you. Again, JBC paper we're talking about. Now, the combined knockdown of KDM6A and KDM6B histone demethylases reduces interferon gamma and TNF-alpha in human NK cell populations. That's what we're seeing here, okay? So there's a demethylase and there's the inhibitor, okay? Boom, you get a reduction here at this end. Uh, uh, this, these are just, okay. What you're looking at here, this first set, are looking at scrambled oligonucleotides versus oligonucleotides against those demethylases. So these aren't the inhibitors. These are using siRNA. So you see the scrambled uh, oligonucleotide, no effect on activity. You use the siRNA, it reduces it, it reduces this particular one, it reduces all three, right, compared to the scrambled. Okay, that's what this is trying to tell you here. So all these inhibitions that you're looking at here, okay, such as shown here, is going to be measured according to flow cytometry related to the amount of interferon gamma that's generated, okay? Less interferon gamma is generated when you inhibit the demethylase. That's all it's just showing you, okay? So NK cells were induced with IL-15 as it turns the act, activates them, and then they're treated with JMJD3, Jared one b LNA target, and scrambled uh, control oligonucleotides. So this is an siRNA experiment. So rather than using the inhibitors, chemical inhibitors, we're just showing you that when you block the activity of demethylase using an siRNA and not the scrambled um, uh, ineffective RNA analog, you get a decrease in interferon gamma. So the readout is clean. So these inhibition and knockdown studies, because it's a knockdown because using siRNA, Demonstrate that Jumanji histone demethylases, JMJD3 and the UTX, regulate natural killer cell pro-inflammatory function. That's what this whole slide shows you. All right. Now, 
here's a little discussion of the Bromo domain. Okay, Bromo domain, as I said, are readers. What are they reading? They're reading the epigenome. Okay, so that's what they are. They're proteins which have a specific domain, a Bromo domain, and they read the altered genome. And so you need epigenetic writers. Those are things like the methyltransferases, and acetyltransferases, and maybe just kinases. Okay, see here. Here are your writers, HATs and HMTs, methyltransferases. Okay, the arginine methyltransferase we talked about, right? Um, remember that you this whole system requires transcriptional activation or repression. So that basically is chromatin remodeling. Okay. And that includes changes in DNA replication and changes in DNA damage and repair. I told you that was one of the mechanisms that epigenetics works at. So you can erase epigenetic patterning. Okay. And the erasers, again, we know what they are, the deacetylases and the demethylases. So you can have this entire dynamic system. That's why it's an event, you see. You can have this naked chromatin. You can then write on to it an epigenomic programming pattern. You can read it with the Bromo domain, and then that's going to read out into some kind of signal transduction cascade, right? Because you've altered the DNA. And then, so you've got the reader on top that's measuring, you know, how much acetate is on this particular lysine residue, on this particular histone, that kind of thing. And then in the end, you can erase the whole business and just get back to the naked chromatin. Okay. And it's going to happen anytime during cell cycle, but between stages of cell cycle. Okay. And it, it can happen very rapidly. So the turnover is fast enough that if you're not looking for intermediates in this pathway, you'll never see it. Again, real time alteration of gene expression using epigenetic reprogramming of chromatin. Absolutely canonical to understanding epigenetics, but you see how complicated it becomes when you start putting all the players in. Okay. So I got this from a Nature Reviews drug discovery paper. Uh, I guess it's four years old now. Not quite. Uh, Bromo domain and extra terminal BET protein family are then jet epigenetic readers, you see? Okay. Now, back to our paper. The reason I told you that is so that you know what they're talking about here. Bird 2, Bird 3, Bird 4, and Bird T are all BETs, okay? Those are all Bromo domains. Each have two Bromo domains. Those are readers of the epigenome. And they also have an extra terminal domain that binds acetylated lysines of histone tails and transcription factors, right? So they're, they're the business of reading the epigenome. So BERT4 regulates gene transcription is critical for cell cycle progression and mitosis, just telling you what they do um, in terms of normal physiology. Uh, BERT4 acts as a super enhancer driving expression of oncogenes. So that's a target in cancer research. And it's also an inhibit, a bird for inhibitory drugs can selectively suppress oncogenic drivers. So this is very important in pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical discovery. BET inhibitors compete with acetylated lysines for binding to the Bromo domain pockets of BET proteins, and those include this BET4, bird 4 excuse me. Efficacy in cancer, inflammation, and heart failure, all of those particular pathophysiologies can be targeted by targeting bird 4 the reader. The, the bet eyes, okay, overall the bet inhibitors act by just those are the drugs by disrupting super enhancers that drive expression of chiocogenes such as MYC leading to apoptosis. Okay, that's what happens when you do that. Bets also work through a class of kinases. So these have been well described and the JBC paper, uh, this JBC paper just talks about them. This is not the one we're doing. This is a 2016 paper. I actually talked about it a while back in a previous era, but not sure. All right, back to our JBC paper, uh, this more current, the 2018 paper, see, the Cribs et al. GSKJ4 inhibits pro-inflammatory cytokine production in human peripheral blood natural killer cell subsets. So let's take a look at this. Here's the data. GSKJ4, but not its inactive isomer, okay? Not its inactive isomer, that's this gray bar here, the J5. Um, reduced natural killer cell derived interferon gamma protein expression. This is looking at protein expression. Okay, this is just the flow cytometric. Uh, uh, this is just med this is the raw data and this is the histogram of it. Okay, concerning interferon gamma production and JSK J4 treatment in different peripheral blood derived NK cells. Remember, we had the CD56 CD56 bright. They produced the highest levels of interferon gamma when compared to the other ones. Remember that. Importantly, 
Okay. Importantly, see, these are the, the three different types of phenotypes we're looking at for NK cells. The inhibitor, the demethylase inhibitor treatment resulted in a reduced interferon gamma production in all of the subsets. So it doesn't matter if they have intermediate, high, or low interferon gamma production, that inhibitor will knock out all three of those particular phenotypic uh, origins of those NK cells. This is, a, again, this is the histogram, and this is the data. Okay. So that's all 3B. That's what it's showing you here, that all three of those phenotypes for NK cells are inhibited by the inhibitor by, by knocking down interferon gamma synthesis. GSK4 did not, GSK J4 did not alter the natural killer cell population frequency as assessed by flow cytometry, that's 3C, okay? So basically you don't have an effect on actual cell population frequency with this inhibitor. And GSK J4 led to a reduction in pro-inflammatory tumor necrosis factor, boom. Uh, uh, GM, uh, S, uh, CSF, IL-2, and the anti-inflammatory IL-10, which is interesting, okay? These are all pro-inflammatory, and that's an anti-inflammatory. And finally, natural killer cells, there's our inhibitor, can also induce tumor necrosis factor production in CD14 monocytes, okay? That's a different cell population. In a manner that is cell contact. So now we're looking at how natural killer cells normally work. They have to work to contact other cells. So that means that the GSKJ4 reduced TNF alpha production in CD14 cold cultures. And that's what this data shows you. And so you can transfer that information from the inhibited demethylase in the natural killer cell to cells that are in contact with it. And that's your CD14 cells. Okay. Now, interestingly, Inhibition of demethylation via GSKJ4 variably alters then the set of natural killer cell inflammatory functions. Okay, that's what we're showing you. Naturally occurring pro-inflammatory systems are all altered. Now, not showing you figure four, I'm just going to tell you what it says. In rheumatoid arthritis, which is an autoimmune disease, Natural killer cells are readily detectable in the synovial tissue of patients at early disease stage. It's one of the biomarkers for this, the disease. They constitute about 20% of all the lymphocytes you find there in that synovial fluid, a lot. Synovial joint is enriched, in, and when you're looking at the NK cells, then the CD56 bright NK cells, and they significantly secrete higher levels of interferon gamma when you stimulate them with IL-15. Okay, so remember that phenotype. Now, what else can we say? They observed a significant increase in the frequency of bright cells, right? In treatment naive rheumatoid arthritis patients, peripheral blood, okay? When compared with healthy individuals as observed in a significant reduction in the frequency of interferon gamma when those cells were treated with the inhibitor, okay? So you decrease the amount of pro-inflammatory cytokine in these cell types, okay? In these what kind of cell types? Autoimmune uh, disease, uh, specifically from humans, right, uh, that have rheumatoid arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, natural killer cells. They observed a significant increase in the CD56 bright NK cell frequency in that synovial tissue, just like we said. And they observed when synovial NK cells were given the inhibitor, there was a reduction in interferon gamma. Great. Therefore, in addition to reducing acute inflammation, the demethylase inhibitor may also be beneficial in reducing inflammatory cytokines in clinical setting, because this is a clinical setting of chronic inflammation, such as in rheumatoid arthritis. Now, back to the data. Natural killer cells cultured with the inhibitor reduce rankle expression, resulting in an inhibition of natural killer-mediated osteoclastogenesis. This is another readout of the inflammatory response. So rankle, which is receptor activator for nuclear factor kappa B, ligand, sorry, the expression of rankle was reduced both in RA patient and healthy donor-derived NK cells following treatment with the demethylase. And those are figures B and C. You see, when you give them the inhibitor, either in RA patients or healthy donors, you turn down this rankle protein, okay? The effect is specific to knockdown of the demethylases as evidenced by downregulation of rankle expression using, uh, again, a knockdown uh, approach, which is shown in figures D and E, okay? Using knockdown, meaning using uh, siRNA, okay? 
All right. So in other words, if you knock down the rankle, it's the same as if you knock down the demethylases okay, in terms of the readout. So NK cells from rheumatoid arthritic patients are also involved in mediating osteoclastogenesis, okay, leading to a bone erosion. So when you get osteoclastogenesis from the pro-inflammatory response, you get bone erosion. So does, so question, does the Jumanji demethylase inhibition also inhibit osteoclastogenesis? It'd be another thing we'd like to see, right? And the answer is, yep, <laughs> Natural, natural killer pretreatment with a J4 inhibitor results in significantly reduced osteoclast numbers, and that's what we're looking at here, okay, associated with that rankle protein. Okay, so these are again done with flow cytometry. So that's really great, right? So you've got another positive phenotypic effect now on the clinical end, right? You're looking at rheumatoid arthritis, you're knocking out that demethylase, you know you're docking down TNF-alpha and also interferon gamma which means you're knocking down the pro-inflammatory response that's induced by IL-15 in that system. And here's another really important readout, this negative effect of osteoclastogenesis. And we also see that that got uh, banged down, which means you get less bone erosion, which is all good because bone erosion is what one of the terrible things about rheumatoid arthritis. All right. Now, JSK, J4 impacts cell cycle. Okay, what kind of genes are affected here? Now we're looking at what are the actual genes. Then we looked at all the cell effects. Now we're looking at what genes might be involved. They're actually proteins then. The inhibitor impacts cell cycle, cytokine production, we already know that, growth factor regulation, signaling, epigenetic factors, chromatin pathways, and even metabolic pathways like glucose metabolism. See, it's all the log scale of the effects of the inhibitor. In fact, you get about 1,300, 1,350 down-regulated genes from the inhibitor and about 880 up-regulated genes of 2,228 that were looked at. Okay, it was just done on an array. A general anti-inflammatory, anti-proliferative effect was uh, what seems to occur when you use the inhibitor. Notch signaling and glycolysis are important for natural killer cell function and they're duly affected by maintaining the methylome. Okay. There was a metallothionin upregulation, which is interesting. Metallothionin binds metals. And a reduction in inflammatory cytokines, which we already knew about, demonstrating a robust natural killer cell transcriptomic change following the demethylase inhibition. This is all really important. We don't really know. They're not sure yet about this metallothionin thing, but it really had a whopping effect. Look at that. 15 log scale change. Oh, my gosh. All right. All right. Now, pro-inflammatory gene transcription is tanked then when demethylation is inhibited. But cytotoxicity of the cancer cells by NKs where demethylation is inhibited remains intact. This is what's important. So you're separating out the cytotoxicity, which you want in cancer cell annihilation. Uh, at the same time, you're diminishing inflammation, which can actually induce tumorigenesis. And overall, pro-inflammatory response is not good in the body. So despite some downward expressions of, of, of a few, actually, protocytotoxic genes, cytotoxicity physiology is not impaired by using the inhibitor. Because of the downward expression of the pro-inflammatory genes, actually, the natural killer cells lose the ability to promote inflammation. The drug and her knockdown using sRNA inhibited demethylase induced an increase in histone H3K27 methylation, okay? Because if you inhibit the demethylase, you're going to increase methylation. And that resulted in a reduced natural killer cell inflammatory function. Basically, that's what this says. <clears throat> the key is in quantitative effects leading to qualitative effects, and that requires a threshold. That's what's really important. You know, when you alter quantity enough, you get a qualitative effect. Always remember that. Indeed, a subtle down regulation of pro-cytotoxic genes, as they observed, could actually enhance their effect by streamlining signal transduction cascades. It's not overloaded in circuitry. So what, let's do summary here. DNA methylation plays an important role in the regulation of interferon gamma and perforin expression following IL-15 stimulation of NK cells. DNA methylation plays an important role there, okay? HDAC inhibitors, that's the deacetylase that would suppress interferon gamma expression following cytokine stimulation as well. What cytokine? IL-15. The bet bromodomains, the reader inhibitors, potently downregulate interferon gamma production, further supports the role of the chromatin acetylation 
because remember the verbal domains are the readers of acetylation and recognition of specific acetylysine by reader domains in LK cell biology. Okay, this is a little crosstalk here, methyl, methylome, acetylome. Okay, it's all good. It's all epigenetics. Phenotypic consequences of cytokine expression, repression, excuse me, are best explained by the global increases in that particular histone lysine 27 methylation. That's the, that was the key one that we always see come up, either by using the sRNA or by the inhibitors. The net uptick of glycolytic enzymes by the GSKJ4 suggests methylation results in an elevated rate of aerobic glycolysis with an increased flux as controlled by mTOR, providing the necessary metabolic precursors for proliferation and effector functions. And that's also important, again, for the NK cells. The NK cells, remember this is not, it's a tumor, right? Because you know that when you get aerobic glycolysis in the tumor, that's a bad thing. Observed inhibition of bone eroding osteoclastogenic rankle expression, remember that experiment? By the demethylase inhibitor, suggests a general anti-inflammatory phenotype of demethylase inhibition in human, those are human immune cells. NK cells are at the axis then between the innate and the acquired immune response and thus transduce a global mobile, because these are natural killer cells, signaling via what we call a diaventological pathway involving epigenetics and the reprogramming of cellular fate. This is a good example now from the literature. We're starting to see more evidence for a diaventological aspect of physiology and pathophysiology when we look at a specific epigenomic reprogramming of a specific immune cell that that is methylation patterning in particular histones uh, and NK cells. Now, what is the verifying literature? Let's go on a little bit here. Require concerning immunoepigenic tailoring of individual biomedical events, because we could ask that question. What about other immunoepigenetic phenomena? Here's a paper from uh, a really good journal, actually, Prostaglandins and Quatrains, Essential Fatty Acids. I love this journal. Of course, I'm a lipid biochemist. Why wouldn't I? But all people would love it if they read it more. Just like if you read, read more Kierkegaard, you're going to fall in love with them. All right. Now, if there is a link between dietary omega-3 fatty acids, which is what this paper is yapping about, vitamin B12 and folic acid, C1 metabolism, it may involve bioenergetics and membrane-mediated DNA, DNA methylation patterns. Okay, Possibility, right? Could be, okay, because you can see one metabolism, bioenergetics is going to be involved there. Now, turns out pregnant maternal intake or metabolism of those nutrients, omega 3s and the B vitamins, and fetal lip metabolism, okay, the, the intake, of meta- intake or metabolism of those nutrients and fetal lipid metabolism in pregnant systems may suggest a role for maternal omega 3 fatty acids and vitamin B12 on now. If you watch my lectures on lipids, you would know what this means. Phosphatidylethanol amine and methyltransferase. PE is a phospholipid found in membranes. And when you methylate it three times, you make PC, phosphatidylcholine. Phosphatidylcholine or choline is trimethylethanolamine. Where do you get the methyl group from? Where do you think? Acetylcemethionine. Where does it get it from? The interactions of vitamin B12 associated folic acid metabolism. Of course, C1 metabolism. AMP kinase phosphorylation. Oh boy, we're bringing this way back from a, a other whole really classical Veravet lectures that you probably need to go back and look at if you haven't seen them. AMP kinase phosphorylation of the methyltransferase, DNA methyltransferase 1, decreases the methylation of promoters okay, for several mitochondrial biogenesis transcription factors. Wow, look at that. Decreases the methylation of promoters. Okay, so that means they actually get more right? So Atomet then, remember that, is a methylation source and can be diverted for phosphatidylcholine synthesis, right? Because of the trimethylation of ethanolamine, see, from PE, thus altering membrane biophysical predicates. All this stuff we just talked about here, the adiponectin pathway and epigenetic process like chromatin remodeling. Yeah, okay, those are the readouts there. And also this mitochondrial biogenesis factor, which AMP kinase kicks up. Okay, so it's like a reservoir. You have the methyl groups to make PC. You're not adding the methyl groups to what? To things like methyltransferases, you see? So it's a reservoir for methyl groups. And that then associates with membrane biophysical predicates, membrane fluidity, 
which is one of the mechanisms I talked about at the very beginning, including those associated with mitochondria, peroxidomes, and the plasma membrane. Another whole beautiful set of lectures we can come up with there. Competition for atomethane between membrane retailering, making phosphatidylcholine, for example, out of PE, and DNA histomethylation, or even enzymatic activity via the AMP kinase, would affect the epigenome of immune cells. Again, we're driving down that point that says that we've got immune cells, we've got epigenetic patterning, we have global regulation of cellular metabolism. And even from the diet, remember diet, omega-3 fatty acids. Now, here's another paper. This is Biochemistry and Chemical Biology, Structural Biology, and Molecular uh, Biophysics, an open access article. And there's the website that you can read it from. That's just published last month. Actually, two months ago now. Sorry, this is May. And the title of that is Acer Chain Asymmetry and Polyunsaturated Brain Phospholipids Facilitate Membrane Fasciculation Without Leakage. Now, that seems like way far afield, but now check this out. Phospholipids with two polyunsaturated fatty acids make membranes prone to vesiculation, so they make vesicles, so they can act as transporting membranes, such as endosomes, but they're highly permeable. Whereas asymmetric, put a fatty acid in the one position of these phospholipids that's saturated, like steric acid, and the second one being a polyunsaturated, that provides a trade-off between efficient membrane vesiculation and low membrane permeability. Okay, so it alters membrane fluid dynamics by changing the level of polyunsaturation of one of the fatty acids. When incorporating the phospholipids, DHA, acetylcosaxonic acid, which happens to be an omega-3, makes membranes more deformable than arachidonic acid. So see, there's a big difference here, this overall effect on whether or not you make vesicles or, permeability, or make them more permeable. So... Fatty acid profiles in specific molecular species, that means either having saturated, polyunsaturated, or two polyunsaturated molecular species, are associated with membrane organizations such that phosphatidylcholine fatty acids are distinct from the ones found in PE or PS. And that's why the methyl group linkage, the epigenome, is linked, you see, to the molecular species of the lipid, which can then affect leakage and vesiculation. Wow, if that's not diaventomic, I don't know what it is. So atomet utilization of methyl groups in this competition with histone lysines, remember, is in part regulated by diet, right? And genetics, of course, because of the enzymes involved in all this retailering, dictating molecular species fatty acyl content. All right. One more paper from American Journal. Remember, this is all verification of what we just looked at. American Journal of Clinical Nutrition. And the paper is, well, look at this. Why did I choose lipids? I can't imagine. DHA-rich omega-3 fatty acid supplementation decreases DNA methylation. Look at that. Is that an absolute, like, you know, it, 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 takes, it takes a nail and drives it right into the 2 by 4 here. Decreases DNA methylation in blood leukocytes. The omega-AD study, big study in humans. At six months, the omega-3 fatty acid groups, so the feeding fatty acid, displayed market increases in what you would guess DHA, dicosahexaenoic acid, EPA, dicosahexaenoic acid, the two omega-3s that were fed, they uptick the uh, plasma concentrations, and they decrease the methylation in two out of four CPG sites. You see? You give more omega-3 fatty acids, you decrease the amount of methylation on cytosines here, not the histones they were measuring here in this omega-AD study. Then you get a hypomethylation. That's what it means. They have less methyl groups showed a reverse correlation to changes in plasma, EPA concentration, but DHA not. Now, I know why that is, because DHA is a reservoir for EPA, but you don't need to know that. Supplementation with omega-3 fatty acids for six months was associated with global DNA hypomethylation, again, of these peripheral blood leukocytes. Okay, that's what PBLs are. Trial was actually, you can look at this trial online. It's registered as clinicaltrials.gov, and there it is. And this particular um, aspect of it came out in 2017. Not that long ago, October, six months ago, something like this, seven months ago. Now, given what we learned from the paper I just went through, the JBC paper 2018, this work might suggest that omega-3 fatty acids could induce inflammatory versus cytotoxicity function in circulating NKs, you see? We don't know. So while it looks good here in terms of hypomethylation, uh, we know that when you affect NK cells, you turn the NK cells into pro-inflammatory. Now, is that good or bad? It depends on what the NK cells are supposed to be doing, right? right. Case in point, 
natural killer cells and some dialectical conclusions. Now, again, here's your natural killer cell. You have inhibitory receptors. That's why it's IR, inhibitory receptors. G, isn't that clever? And here's your MHC class one. Remember, we looked at this at the very beginning, right? There's your inhibitory receptor. There's your active or activating receptors, the P30, 44, and 46, uh, the DNA, AM, JAM, and the NKG2D. And when they turn that on, remember, you make the cytotoxic granules, the granzymes, and the, and the perf uh, performance. Now, recall, it's a paper now, published now about seven years ago, Natural killer cells are an element of the innate immune response. And as we have seen, they're under epigenetic pre-programming. We just went through that. Natural killer cells are a vital line of offense against infection and tumors. Not defense, offense. They're out there killing, right? All right. They function as all immune cells do through cell surface receptors, followed by activation and an agency. That means a, a specific activity of that system, of that event that delivers a potent response to disease involving both cytotoxicity and inflammation. We've already covered this. Cytotoxicity involves degranulation and delivery of lytic enzymes like granzyme, while inflammation involves both attention to and secretion of cytokines. Okay. Control of natural killer cells involves a dialogue between activating inhibitory receptors. We know this. These receptors are distributed to multiple cell lineages target cells of various kinds, including activating uh, this in whole activating system here, while the inhibitory receptors like the killer immunoglobulin-like receptor, the CURs, uh, are on other cell lineages, okay? So the CUR receptors provide elaboration of the immune response to specific pathogens that are not otherwise indicated by inhibition by the MHC class 1 expression. That's shown here. It's from a paper in 2015, NK cell inflammation and the clinical outcome of colorectal cancer. So here you have these uh, uh, metallic uh, 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 matrix metalloproteases affecting natural killer cells. Okay, They're now binding here to the CRC cell. That's the colorectal cancer cell. They're triggering through the natural killer cell. Okay, And these happen to be C16 low type of natural killer cells. It's showing you that uh, the TNF alpha turns them on and is secreted by them. Okay, Now when you have CD16 low expressing NK cells, but you have NK26 uh, uh, G2D, which is the activating, they're not going to allow, okay, this, they're going to be blocked by these mica B. The mica B are going to be secreted by the colorectal cell in interaction with cytotoxic T lymphocytes. So I guess it's going to block this cell if it has that receptor, okay? However, after interacting with the colorectal cell, if you have um, the CD16 low phenotype, but you don't have that receptor, right? The one that normally would be involved, again, in activating, you release interferon gamma. Remember, you, you release that, okay? And when you do that, what happens is then you activate this whole system, okay? And you activate this whole system, thus furthering the inhibition of the natural killer cell. So that's what happens in colorectal cancer. You are now corrupting the natural killer cell mediated destruction of the cancer cell. And the cancer cell is actually getting its information from cytotoxic T lymphocytes. So they're not helping out at all here because they need to be engaged with that cell type to carry out this dysfunction. Now, this is showing you more activity about the T cell will inter generate interleukin-6. It can be turned on by interleukin-1 beta, a good pro-inflammatory cytokine. Macrophages can release that. Uh, natural killer cells actually produce leptin and leptin activates macrophages, which produce interleukin-1 beta, which turns on T cells, which turns on interleukin-6, which also turns on interleukin-2. Interleukin-2 works to activate natural killer cells, which can produce interferon gamma, which can then go to the colorectal cancer cell, bind to macrophages. If they have the uh, HLA class 2 antigen, they're further going to interact by making this uh, interaction works stronger, this IL-2 response, and this is a good response, okay? This is where you can get the cells to destroy the colorectal cancer cell, okay? Using, again, the natural killer cell, but here the leptin response and the macrophage. Here the macrophage is not involved, right? Okay. So you get the idea. Natural killer cell inflammation is, uh, is associated with the clinical outcome of colorectal carcinoma, okay? That's what we're talking about here. Depending on how you're signaling, through the pro-inflammatory response, you can kill those colorectal cells. So 
Let's finally get to the diaventological perspective. Natural killer cells crosstalk with both the innate and acquired immune response, thus potentiated signal that can transduce across multiple layers of signaling valence. Using methylation patterning, natural killer cells can be flipped to be agents of cytotoxicity or inflammation. We saw that. The inflammatory associated output of natural killers involves cells of the innate and acquired responding lineage. Now, here's some other interesting additions. Gliomas are characterized with local cytokine and chemokine secretion leading to tumor growth via microenvironmental immunosuppression. And that can be overturned by infiltrating natural killer cells, secreting interferon gamma. Indeed, interleukin-15 can trigger that anti-tumor myeloid lymphoid response. And that was from a paper in eLife published just a few months ago. Okay, more interaction here, more diaventological perspective. Now, here's one more thing. This is really cool. Chromatin instability, which you see in cancers, is linked to tumor metastasis via a mechanism that starts with incomplete chromosomal sorting at interphase. That generates something called mini chromosomes. They become detached during interphase, and those leave the nucleus, actually, and upon rupture of their membrane, they release double-stranded DNA. These mini chromosomes leave the nucleus. They, they traffic double-stranded DNA into the cytoplasm, and that triggers an inflammatory response that taxis those cells starting metastasis. So this is really bizarre. These aren't, t these aren't NK cells, these are tumor cells. How do tumor cells become metastatic? One way is to turn them into pro-inflammatory tracking metastatic tumor cells. So using the same system. And this paper was published uh, in Cell just recently. It talks about the sting cell death program upstream Again, of NLRP3. Uh, so this is really important uh, for us to consider as well. We walked away from the immune system for a while to show you that this is ubiquitous. So this chromatin instability phenomenon employs similar mechanisms. That's why I brought it up here. Those that we saw in the NK inflammatory arm, suggesting a cellular transformation via a diamphetological pathway. That's what we're talking about here, okay? Therefore, the immunoepigenetic component of the trigonal planar diaventome, which I showed you several slides ago, can be obtained not only within myeloid cell populations and lymphoid cell populations, but indeed across all dividing cell lineages, thus establishing a processive event, you see, perpetual through time biochemical event ontology unique to individuals until death. That's a whole thing going back to diaventology. So finally, we've reached a conclusion of today's seminar. Again, that's me, Dr. Daniel J. Guerra. There's my specific email address. Please contact me there. Uh, here's our email address for the company and the website. Remember that we are scientists verifying published evidence in medical biosciences. Of course, this is somewhere in, yeah, I guess probably Utah, right? You bet. All right. So long one to talk today, but hopefully interesting to folks. Just about an hour, so that's not too bad, an hour and eight minutes. I know that that's not as long as some of the ones I've given. Anyways, I hope you have a very good afternoon and a very good week. Remember Mother's Day coming up this Sunday, only a few days away. Flowers, candy, both to your moms and all their loved uh, females in your family and, and life. Thanks a lot for your attention. I only have one more thing to say. <laughs>